I'm Charlotte McLeod with investingnews.com and here today with me is Peter Grandage of Peter Grandage and Company. Thank you so much for joining me. Great to have you once again. Good to be back with you. Thank you. Really good to be speaking with you. And it's been a little while since we spoke. Our last interview was at the very beginning of January. I think it was the first one of the year for me. So lots to catch up on. And you had said in at the beginning of the year, looking back at 2023, you really couldn't afford another year like 2023, either mentally or financially. So I thought now that we're a little bit more than halfway through 2024, how is it stacking up if you compare it to last year? Uh, a light year is better. Uh, fortunately, at the beginning of the year, I was able to uh, take some serious good profits in uranium. I had been a big bull from three or four years before that. Uh, the junior market, as bad as it still remains relative, it's improved off of last year. And the mining shares themselves, the major producers, have done real well. And uh, my favorite metal, the thing that I switched very aggressively to at the end of 2021, continues to outperform both stocks and bonds, and that's gold. As you and I speak, it you know it's been touching 2,500. Still hard to imagine that number when somebody used to be at a PDAC show hoping it would get above 300. So uh, it's uh, it, it has been enjoyable for a change to see something work out so well. Yeah, definitely. It's been it's been a major change, I think, for a lot of people who have been watching the sector for a long time. And you answered this a little bit talking about uranium, but I was going to ask, have you made any changes to your portfolio so far this year that you would mention? Yeah, so since you were last and I spoke, uh, I did come out of the uranium. It's not because I think it was suddenly a bad place to be, but we had triple digit gains everywhere we looked. Uh, we were buying when the metal was under 20 and it was hitting close to 110 when we were selling. I think it's still an industry that's okay. I think it got ahead of itself in terms of the enthusiasm of, by investors. Uh, that has peeled back and it probably can still use a little bit more of a correction, but I wouldn't be against it. I will tell you that uh, bonds, as I start at the beginning of the year, I said with a lesser of two evils than the equities. The first half, I expect that we would get by, but I thought by the second half, we would see a recession. We won't know if that's true until we get into early 2025 and we look back at this time. But I've definitely seen a major, major slowdown. So I feel pretty good overall about what our outlook was starting at the beginning of the year. Yeah. And maybe we look just a little bit more closely at uranium. So for you, you're out of that for now. You might get back into it at some point, do you think? I, the issue that I have with it, and issue is probably too strong of a word, the challenge that I have with it is, unlike other metals where there's a plethora of producers and people close to producing it, the uranium market is a unique place where there's a handful of public companies you can own, a few companies that own the physical metal, and the rest are just little companies hoping to find you know the next big mine. And uh, it's, it's a challenge there because a lot of those, even if they're successful and failures to norm in junior resource, doesn't matter what metal you're looking for, where more companies are not going to go the whole nine yards. But the enthusiasm was too high. I, it wasn't like Bitcoin, and that's a thing that I've avoided like the plague, and I get abused until recent days. Now the emails have slowed because it's declined. Uh, but uh, the, the uranium market didn't have the assortment of... Uh, a lot of choices. That's why I used to say, if you remember, Cameco, I was you know, buying at eight or nine because you had Cameco, one or two other public companies, and the rest were you know, companies hoping to become public, you know, producers someday. So it's an okay market. I just don't think it's undervalued yet to drive me back to it. Okay. I think that that's a great explanation. Helps me understand where your head is at on uranium. So if we look over to gold, which she said is, of course, working out really well in 2024, when we had that conversation at the beginning of the year, you mentioned that the geopolitical angle was something that was going to get much stronger. And definitely we've seen that become so much more prevalent in 2024 already, even just this week, looking at all the volatility over in the Middle East. So I wanted to get your, your thoughts on there. 
Is this something, how concerned should investors be about those developments across the world? Well, I think the single biggest gain for gold has come because a bunch of nations are recognizing that the unification of many of them, known as the BRICS, is a legitimacy. It's uh, going to be shown to be more than just that, I think, when they have their fall meetings. And I think, of course, that huge acquisition by central banks, a variety of them of physical gold, and something which isn't spoken about much at all, that so many of these countries have also repatriated their gold out of the United States back to their own banks, was clearly a setup to be prepared for a change on the world scene. Now, I view it, and I've said for well over a year, that when the BRIC nations are all said and done three to five years from now, we will look at it and see that their impetus on world trade was similar to what the Industrial Revolution did for world trade. And the problem with this is the United States and, unfortunately, Canada are going to be basically outside looking in. And uh, at a time when both of them are uh, suffering on a, a in similar grounds politically, socially, and economically. So the BRICS was the first thing. As you and I speak, you're right, the Middle East is getting worse, not better, uh, and, and, and other areas. And so all of that, I think, has been a real, real positive to gold. And what's amazing, Charlotte, and it doesn't matter where we are in Canada or the U.S., even though Canada used to be far more attractive to physical bullying, not as much anymore. The, the, the central bank's banker is the Bank of International Settlements. That, that's who really is the, the representative of what central banks are doing. And they, a few years back, made gold a tier one investment, joining only stocks and bonds. So to them, the world's central bank's central bank views stocks, bonds, and gold on an equal footing. Yet most portfolios have little or no gold still, even at this point in time. And uh, I think that's another reason why I maintain such a bullish stance, because I'm not getting in cabs yet. I'm not getting my hair cut. No one's telling me about some great gold stock or white gold. I mean, I hear that about Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. So I think gold still has quite a ways to go. And uh, all these things that have happened since the, you and I have spoken have really underpinned it and help it accelerate to where it's gotten. I remember around this time last year, there was a lot of anticipation about the BRICS meeting. And you mentioned we're coming up on another BRICS meeting later this year. So do you have any sense of what we might see coming out of that meeting that's, that's in, a, I think, a couple of months? Yeah, the, the difference this time is there's a lot of known evidence, reports, first of all, Two of the leading speakers out of there, China and Russia, their their finance ministers and all, have held a series of bunch of meetings. Have they disclosed the formation of a particular unit or how they plan, how they're going to trade, how they're going to exchange uh, to pay each other? And, and right now, the talk is that it'll be about a basket of currencies, about 60% of this unit, and 40% is going to be gold. And... Uh, a year before that, everybody thought it was going to come out last year, that news. It was too early. There weren't enough members yet. And there was also talk about other commodities. But at the end of the day, they recognized the one commodity that works, the only one that has worked for a couple thousand years, is gold. And now it looks like it's going to be part of. So what I expect or I anticipate is these meetings will take place. The world will wake up to what's really happening with now almost 50-something countries that are applying or going through this process of applying to become members. And I think Wall Street will view it and see that this is probably the biggest thing they missed in modern times and still either get laughed at by a typical Wall Street talking head or not know enough to even be qualified to talk about it. And they're going to have a lot of catching up to do in 2025 because it's a really, really important uh, economic, social, and political event that's happening. And it's really progressing well and faster than even some of us thought it would. Okay, that will be a very fascinating meeting to watch. And it would be great to catch up with you after that happens. So we'll keep an eye on that, definitely. So looking at that divide, you know, you mentioned the U.S. and also Canada over here on the outside looking in. 
probably at least a little bit in the U.S. because it's so internally focused looking at the election. So I wanted to also talk to you about the election coming up. We talked previously about the turmoil that that can bring. And you've really emphasized being prepared and preserving your wealth as we head into, you know, we don't really quite know what could be coming. So I wondered if you could review, you've talked about building an arc. That's a way to get prepared. Can you review what that looks like to you? Sure. So the political part is part of it. And at the beginning of the year, when we last spoke, I was telling people that I was anticipating one, if not both major candidates, not being on the ballot coming election day. Well, one's clearly off and one almost was off, not to his own choice. Uh, but political paralysis is one of five key factors. So the five factors to build Peter Granich's financial arc was an old staple. It's been spoken about, but it's just getting worse and worse. And very little attention still is paid to it. And we've now hit 30. You know, Charlotte, I've been at this my 41st year involved in the financial world. And I never imagined one day I'd be talking to a lovely lady telling her we have 35 trillion with a T in hard debt, not counting our unfunded liabilities, which are double or triple of that. When I started the business, we didn't even have a trillion dollars in debt, and we had balanced budgets. We haven't had one of those since the Clinton uh, administration. So the debt issue and the servicing of the interest now is the problem, Charlotte. Most people watching this interview are going to be living when the time comes and when it's going to be really challenging to pay the interest. And we know that because we have something called the Congressional Budget Office here in the United States. It's probably one of the last places where there is some bipartisanship left. And they've just upped their view to the debt reaching $54 trillion in less than 10 years. And that's on the basis of strong economies during that time. If the economies don't live up to their expectations, then we're going to get to that level that much faster. Well, how are we going to pay interest on that five percent interest on that's two and a half trillion dollars. The best this country has ever taken in was five trillion three hundred billion a couple of years ago. And even if you boost that revenue up some, we're going to have to pay interest and not be able to then pay for the services that we've been accustomed to. So that's a huge problem. The second one, and I, I don't want to take too much time, but the retirement and uh, aging crisis is very critical to me. 65% of Americans at work can paycheck to paycheck. Uh, they're never going to reach those beautiful commercials that they watch about how you retire and live this happy life in the last part of your life. But where that problem exists is as they get older, they'll, they'll, be, they'll be asking government for more help. But now you're going to have an aging crisis where soon boomers, who I'm part of, will peak. And as we become less and less, because unfortunately we're all going to die, even though when we're younger, we don't think so. Uh, but the bottom line is that money shift is going to take place, but with that shift will come the political power that money brings. And soon it's going to get to a point where some young folks are going to be taxed much harder, working that much harder than I had to maybe at their age, seeing more and more go to taxes. And a good part of that is to take care of some old geezer named Grandich who made it to 85 or 90 and now wants to spend a half a million or a million dollars for some long or heart replacement. So I believe there's going to be a crisis of ages, too. The third is immigration, and I'll just leave it as the cost of taking as many as 25 million people, most of who are coming with their shirts on their back, that economic cause, not talking any of the political ramifications from that. The fourth, we already spoke about the BRICS. And then the fifth is the toughest one, because this is the one where most of us, even in Canada, would go and hope could solve any one of all those problems. And we have political paralysis now in the United States. The Democrats and the Republicans can no longer go in a room and make worthwhile legislation. And to compound that issue, they each have a splintering group from their center, one moving more left and on the other side moving more right. And so if and when whatever hits the fan comes, they're not going to be able to go in the room like they used to the last time in 2008 and come up with something half feasible. And that's the biggest problem of it all. So to answer, sorry for going a long time on that, but the political paralysis and the political issues across the world, the geopolitics, the Middle East, uh, Ukraine, China, Taiwan, all these things 
What really concerns me the most as you and I speak, the complacency among investors and especially the professional community. With all these issues, there just seems to be a carefree attitude that everything works, the Fed will just cut interest rates again, the stock market will go higher, and everybody will live happy ever after. And these issues we face now are a hundred times more complicated and troublesome than any other time going back to my 40-year career. I think you're right. There does seem to be that general lack of concern and the thought that things will be okay, maybe because previously they, they have been okay and things have been fixed. So for you, when you look at this, what would you what would you suggest to investors to do to preserve their wealth to to get through this? So I put out this thing. I don't have it in front of me. I call Peter Grant. It's just Ten Commandments, and I'm I'm not acting like God. It's not a godly, uh, spiritual thing. But I, the, the overriding part, and it has been for me for a lot of years, is less is more. I've learned at at, at one time money was my god child. I mean, I I thought if the more money I make, the more happiness will be, the more things I could have, and that's one of the big fibs that we're told, and we get caught up in this rat race. And, Every time we make some more, if we only make can make some more. It's kind of like golf. Every time you get a lower score, you should be happy, but you wish I can just go lower and lower. And the problem is very few ever get to be great. So the bottom line is less is more. The second one thing is debt is the dirtiest of four-letter words. It is, it is at the root cause. We just spoke about it as a nation. It is at the root cause of many people who have money issues because What's happened is seven or eight out of 10 families I still see in our planning group come in living at least one financial lifestyle above what they make. Everybody says, well, how do they do that? Well, first they borrow. There's a few thousand dollars worth of car leases parked outside. There's a double or triple mortgage sometimes. They've not saved for retirement or not contributing to the 401 because you're using that money to live their lifestyle now. And so spending less and staying within your means but capital preservation, something that hasn't been on our mind, both in the financial advisory community, as well as investors for almost four decades, because things were good. You can make a lot of money in a lot of different ways. Now, I think it's far more important to preserve what you have versus trying to appreciate of what you have. And I don't mean appreciate in terms of liking it, but seeing it grow from one to two to three or four times what it is. And I think the older you are, the more you have to preserve and be careful. And as I like to say, be a live chicken versus a dead duck. Do you see attitudes shifting more toward what you're advocating for? Because I think in particular, the less is more is really kind of goes in direct opposition to, you know, stock market up, up, up and all the instant gratification that people want to see. So are you seeing it starting to change? I, I would like to tell you yes, but I would tell you it's probably less of a concern on the average person than it was even a couple of years ago. Uh, yes, in the midst of COVID, people were concerned about dying and people might have went back for a little bit of a while trying to put things in order, but they got carefree again. And I don't see any movement. And what's worse is I don't see anywhere in government, anywhere on either side of the aisle, trying to make these tough decisions. Anybody talking about, hey, we can't keep spending two, three trillion dollars more a year than we have because in less than 10 years, who's ever around at that time is not going to get a government in any way, shape or form that they get now. So no, I, I, I'm sorry to say, and it's probably one of the biggest reasons why I'm so bearish is that I don't see any real movement to put uh, the individual's home in order, which needs, you got to start there. You can't expect to start at the top and get the whole country to straighten out. You have to start with yourself. And it's still not something that a lot of people are. are oh, this is what I get to hear. This what this is what's described after I speak somewhere. You know, Mr. Granich, I really, uh, I really believe you're right, but I want you to know I'm praying you're going to be wrong. And I say, well, why are you praying I'm going to be wrong? Because if you're right, I'm in big trouble. That's the typical line that I get back. So yeah, they see it. They think it's possible, but to take the hard steps that they think is hard uh, is is very hard, if not impossible, for the average person right now to do. It's going to take, so the you know, follow up question sometimes, sorry, Charlotte, but, but you were going to ask it. But the follow up question is well, what has to happen? Well, normally something of calamity has to happen to when finally people say, okay, enough is enough. I got I, I to change things. It's like, 
you know, all of a sudden you realize you put on a lot of weight and you went to the doctor and they said you had a heart attack. Most people then try to change. Would they've changed before that? No. And that's why I think we're going to have to go through a very tough period of time, probably generational, meaning that it's those of us of my age are not going to see a great recovery, but uh, it's going to take a lot of years because we spent a lot of decades going in the wrong direction. Right. And interesting point that you made on the election. I think one question I've been asking a lot is from an, an investor's perspective, does it matter who is in office next? And I am getting an answer a lot that is essentially, well, no, not really, because neither of them is going to do anything about the debt. Would you would you agree with that? I would agree about the debt prop, but I think it's wrong to say both are going to be the same. I think there's two great dynamics there. Uh, first of all, we're all on the assumption as we talk that uh, Harris will now be put in the convention and made the official candidate uh, on that basis. I think it's more of the same there. And if you agree with it, that's fine. And if you disagree with it, you're going to be just as mad if she wins uh, than you were before it happens because it, it, there, she doesn't even have anything to stand on that she stood by herself or, 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 you know, Biden at least ran when he ran that, you know, for all the years he was a senator and all the things he claimed he was going to do, which he didn't end up doing. And it was clear and evident now to everybody can't hide it anymore that he was all in a sense being propped up. And I think you'll get that same type of regime if she wins. What I think Trump brings different to the table is a few key things. Uh, I think one Let's not forget he made us energy efficient, whether you like the guy or not. And you either love the guy or you hate him. There's no middle ground with this man, apparently. I may be one of the few that's in the middle. But he made us energy efficient, and we, we lost that almost overnight through this administration. I think he's going to try to take us back to that. I also think he's going to be someone that is going to be more concerned about laws being broken, whether it's borders uh, within internal you know, living and so forth. I also think he's going to be someone that is going to maybe pull back faster than most people think in terms of being on the world stage, that it, enough is enough. You know, he argued about NATO and he was not a, that they weren't living up to it and all. And he won't have to be worrying about running again. Uh, so I think in those areas and a few other areas, there are dramatic differences and things would change. Certainly, if you're in energy stocks, uh, that, they're, they're one of the first that are going to, I think, will benefit from that. And also, uh, I think the thing that you have to remember about him is he, he, he does bring a business academic brain to this. I don't think, no offense, and it's not because she's a woman or the color of her skin, but she hasn't shown to be anybody academically business-wise. And so everything, anything she would do is because somebody else is telling her. Trump tends to do a lot of things that he believes and wants done. And at least, I, I guess the way to describe it, him versus her is what you see with him is what you're going to get. Okay. So those are some really interesting considerations that I think people should keep in mind. And one other direction that I want to make sure we go is to look at the Fed. We did just have the Fed's latest meeting. They held rates steady, as I think was very widely expected. What do you see coming? Because I think there's strong expectations for a cut in September. On the other hand, I've seen some people say they're not going to cut before the election. So any any thoughts from you there? Well, they say they don't think political. I, I don't believe that. Just like people say umpires don't bet. You find out that umpires do bet. Uh, so I, 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 I think there's a, there, there is a if they were leaning any way, they'd be leaning to Harris versus versus Trump. Certainly Powell. I don't think he's a fan at all of Trump. Would he make a cut just because it might get her over the line? I don't know to that point. What I do think that the mistake is, is that, which we discussed at the onset, and that is a simple cut in interest rates now just sends everything back honky-dory and we're all great anymore. You'd be surprised that if we ever have to cut interest rates a lot, the damage that will do to the dollar, but more importantly, that is that it will reignite inflation that's always been a lot worse than our reporting. I'll just say this, and I'll say this to all blue in the face, Charlotte. Anybody who wants to tell me that goes shopping, pays rent, buys clothes, 
whatever the regular stuff and tells me that inflation is only going up two tenths or three tenths of one percent. Everybody client that we have that's in businesses that own restaurants tell us it's literally doubled the cost or sometimes tripled the cost of food in five years or less. So I believe inflation is a lot higher than what we're told. And the problem that compounds that is wage power, the ability to get higher wages has been lost. The it, unions don't have that leverage anymore. We don't have that leverage. We're creating machines and ways, things that are going to replace a lot of people. So you're not going to have that leverage of your, what, your labor that you can bring from your back and all. So uh, while there may be a lessening of interest rates over a period of time, I don't think we're going to see one or 2% interest rates again and you know inflation at zero or something like that. I think a follow-up question that I have is, you know, I ask about the Fed quite a lot to different people because traditionally there's there's an impact for gold. How important is the Fed for the gold price at this point? I think a narrative I've heard this year is when the Fed makes its first cut, gold is really going to take off, but gold is already really moving. So what are your thoughts? Well, I can only say to those people, if it's only going to first take off, then man, we're going to really get a great price because it's done pretty good so far without that. I don't think they have that effect. I so so let me let me. This is an important thing. So we, those of us who've been around the gold for decades, would would have argued, and I was one of them ten or twenty years ago, that gold was manipulated. That there was a two tier market. There was the paper market, which was basically controlled out of London and New York, uh, and then there was the physical market. And it always seemed that when the physical market was saying people really want to own gold, suddenly. The paper market was hit and it went down and it stayed down. That's gone. The basic movement of gold and the trading of gold has moved to Asia. London and New York are second and third tier players now. And therefore, even when we do have suddenly the old 10, 11 a.m. sell off from the COMEX, or some of us like to call it the CRIMEX, it doesn't last for days and weeks anymore. Sometimes it just lasts for hours. And that's because so much more of the demand and physical market now has overtaken the paper market. Where that hasn't flipped yet is in the silver market. The silver market is still being influenced more by paper. And that's because there, I think there's a much bigger shorter, short position in it. Uh, but the bottom line is the Fed and what the Fed does is probably eighth or ninth on the list now of the 10 most concerns you should have as a gold buyer when probably 20 or 30 years ago was one, two, or three. So I don't think they play anywhere as an important role anymore. I'd be more concerned about what an Asia country or, or uh, banks or what BRICS are talking about than anything the Federal Reserve is talking about now. They're a paper tiger now at best. Okay, very, very interesting and very interesting comments as well on manipulation. I So if I understand correctly, so we're seeing this shift to Asia in the gold market, and we've still got manipulation, but because of this shift, it's it's lessening a little bit. Do you think, you mentioned silver, will that begin to happen in silver as well? I know a lot of people are concerned about that issue. Well, I learned a long time ago, decades ago, I was never going to be the closest, the smartest guy in the street. So what I did was I tried to find the people that appeared that they fit that criteria. And I've been following a couple of people now for a few years. One of this gentleman, his name is Vince Landy, and uh, he has put out some very interesting uh, commentary about what is happening with China and the silver market, how they're now buying physical silver from countries itself. I think the day of reckoning for the silver bears is very, very close. It's probably going to tie with what takes place in BRICS. I think within a few months, we will start to see silver become not only more volatile, but maybe even start to outperform gold to the upside for, for periods of time. Uh, I'm not a silver bug, just so you know. I used to get absolutely yelled at because I used to say, no offense, but I used to say at conferences, owning gold, owning silver over gold was like wanting to kiss your sister. So, but, uh, and, you know, I'd always used to advise at least two or three times more ownership of gold and silver. But right now, and completely, where its price is versus where gold is, 
I would take a balanced approach. I wouldn't be against a 50-50 ownership right now. And that's something new for anybody who knows Pete Granage. That was not a view of mine any time before this. Okay. Interesting to look at how, how things are changing. And if we look at prices a little bit, so I remember at the beginning of the year, you were having a gold price target of 2500 and we're quite close. We've gotten really close a number of times already this year. Have you have you adjusted your your gold outlook for 2024? You're right. So 2536 was the actual number and gold was under 2000 at that time, but that's a number that started when it was around 1300. And boy, it, it, there were didn't really believe sometimes I used to think Pete, you really think it's going to get to 2536, but by and large, uh I I certainly think uh, before the bricks even take place, we'll be there. I, uh, there's too many things that are happening now not to want to drive it. And the last probably piece that's going to be its extra boost is we're seeing some of the things that were highly pushed up earlier, things like Bitcoin, the general stock market, more narrow, the Magnificent 7 and all. We're starting to see some of that excess come out. We're starting to see some of the air out of that, out of those bubbles coming out. And it's flowing into the gold and it will flow into silver as well. So right now, everything's systems look all good. And again, like I said, is no matter where you turn, the only time you're going to hear gold spoken about is in the few little people and that make up the small little part of that sector. It's still not spoken in the general media. It's still treated like uh, kryptonite by the financial service industry. And uh, that's why I still think it still has quite a ways to go. And and what through the price, I'm sorry, so when we get through the price, then we can start to, I'll, I'll tell you what has changed since we last spoke. I never thought of this. I was always the guy that stood at the show and say, yes, I'm bullish on gold, but to talk about 5,000 gold or $10,000 gold, I think that's foolish. You shouldn't, not foolish anymore. There's legitimate possibilities for those type of numbers to be reached, certainly within a matter of, of a couple of years because of all the things in other things that we didn't get discussed in this thing. So I'm um, also think that the upside could be greater now than any other time in my career. Those numbers, I think definitely are sounding a lot more likely than they used to. So I, I understand where you're coming from there. I think another point on gold that we get a lot of questions about our gold price, which is at record setting levels in 2024 versus the gold stocks, some of which have made moves, but not as a group in the way that people would have expected. So, or maybe not expected as the way the way that people would have liked to see them move. So, are you are you surprised how gold stock activity is playing out? Do you expect a catch up? What are you seeing there? So, someone who bet the ranch, and I mean everything they could possibly, particularly in the juniors in the last month. The first good news is the change in that gold market that we talked about. It Manipulation is basically gone. The price is moving up very great. Keep in mind, too, that the majors who are now, many of them are trading at 52-week highs. Early this year when Newmont broke 30, I made a comment. It's the number one gold company in the world. If you don't buy it under 30, you shouldn't be buying anything gold. You know, it's trading up towards 50 now. So the majors have made up, and one of the reasons they're making up is they saw their costs go up a lot in the last few years, even though gold was rising. But now gold's gone several hundred more and their costs are rolling over and going down. So we're starting to see just this quarter now some great free cash flow numbers coming out of the producers, which is going to lead to a lot more M&A uh, mergers and acquisitions. So we have to separate producers and soon to be producers versus the hope and prayer part of the market, we, we call it the junior resource market. Now there, the good news on that is we're finally seeing vital return. And why that's important, yet the, the shares are not running up. And of course, that's what's still keeping people angry. You can just look at my emails to know that. But the bottom line is we're starting to see them trade three, five, ten times more average daily volume than they were a year or two ago. And what that simply means is Buyers have shown up now, but they're not chasing them yet. There's still, if people want to sell it down here, we're going to absorb it. And maybe when the point when no one is, we'll move up a little. And I think that'll change as we see this M&A get really serious. One or two more deals like the ones we just had this week 
you know, where a few billion dollars was spent on a former junior in this deal, gonna, the two parties are going to have to put billions more into this project to develop it. And a lot of that is going to come out because people that bought that company are not going to want to have the major stock that they're going to end up with. So they're going to liquefy and, and look to other things in this market. I think we're just on the cusp, finally, uh, something that's taken two years longer than one should have expected given how gold performed. But I think we're finally on the cusp now that we're seeing the junior market starting to act like it should be. Now, let me make a couple of points, if I may. The big difference in this market, and I think that's what's going to put a cap on the junior market, is we don't have the listening audience that we once had. Let me explain that. 20 years ago at a gold show, there was hundreds of financial advisors, we would call stockbrokers maybe back then, and they built book of businesses buying these juniors. Part of their business was all their business, and they had dozens to several hundred clients each. So the junior company, Acme Resources, got Joe here interested in it. He got Joe or Joanne's all their clients. That business is gone. There's, there might be a handful of people left in North America that do that because you just can't buy and sell stocks for large commissions and charge that to anybody. The second thing that happened is it competition. I hate to say it because I don't like them at all, but cryptocurrencies have stolen the junior resources market's lunch. And the people that might otherwise have come into the junior resource market now have instead gone into the cryptocurrency market. And the problem is in the first go around a couple of years ago, a lot of those speculators got burned. A lot of those things went poof, gone. They're not coming back. Now, unfortunately, it's more centered. It's more talked about a handful, you know, the one being big one being Bitcoin. While I think it's going down, I hope it doesn't implode down, that people get a chance to roll out. But right now, basically, if you're under 40, especially if you're under 30, if you're a junior resource person, you'd be the, the, like the Maytag repairman. You, no one's going to be interested in you. They're going to crypto. And those two things have had a major, major impact and continue and will continue on the junior resource market. So as much as I'm optimistic that we're going to get a lift and a good lift, we're missing two ingredients and one may never come back. Okay. Okay. That makes a lot of sense how you, how you lay it out that way. One follow-up question. So if you are somebody who's looking at the gold juniors, is the best way to approach it right now to look for companies that could be one of those takeover targets for a larger company? I think for the average person that isn't living and breathing this stuff, the best truthfully, is an exchange trader for on the GDX or GDXJ to be more speculative. Uh, there are a handful still of mutual funds. There are a handful of people uh, that, that specialize in this segment of the market. But if they did, how they survived these last few years, they must have been scraping up tickets to Burger King because it's, it's been a disaster on, the, on that side of the business. But I think most people would be better off served where something where someone else is managing it or it's a conglomerate of, of more of them. And you're right, the higher they go up the food chain to producers or near-term producers or royalty companies uh, would be better served, pres preserve potential of, of protecting capital and only with true gambling. And no one wants to call it what we're actually doing. We say we're speculating, but we're gambling. And when you gamble, you have to be both mentally and financially prepared to lose part of all your capital. And the junior resource business, Charlotte, is a, where failures are not. Ten great companies right now, all honest guys and gals running it, work hard every day. Seven or eight of them are not going to go the whole nine yards. They're not going to find a worthwhile deposit to either sell, joint venture, or develop themselves. So it's a business where... You're going to have losses. So people say, oh, granted, he said such and such. If I talk about 10 or 20 companies now, three or four years from now, people are going to say, hey, remember he said blah, because a lot of them are not going to work out. So it's a business also that if you're going to spend time and money in it, you have to spread it out. You, 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 for every one that's going to go up 10 or 20, you're going to have a couple that are going to go to zero or not do any well, better than what you paid for it. And I think that's the, the mistake people make. And unfortunately, a the people that remain in this business don't share that with these people and they come in with false hopes 
and get far more disappointed than they should have been because they've been sold on a belief of something that really doesn't exist to begin with. There is definitely a lot of hope in the sector and that can quickly, quickly get destroyed. So I think that's great advice. And I don't want to keep you too long, but before I let you go, I want to make sure that we check in on copper because I know that copper has been a sector that you're following. How are you feeling about copper right now? Where do you feel we're at in the copper sector at the moment? So we were doing this interview 60 days ago. I said, wow, Charlotte, man, I'm really, copper's really looking good and straight up towards five and give you all the fundamentals about the future. Fast forward to today, all those things in the future still exist. Nothing's changed. What has changed, and, and, and quite surprisingly to many, including myself, is how China might have fallen off the cliff in terms of economics. And you have to be concerned about that because they are a key player in the copper market. Now, I don't think they've fallen off to a point where we're going to see a collapse in copper because one of the benefits now versus any other cycle is there isn't an ample supply sitting somewhere. That's why the future looks so good for it. So it may take longer to get back up through the five that many of us thought it was going to go through and stay above it, but it's not likely to go much below four. So I think you, what you've seen already is you see many of the shares retreat and kind of represent that decline. So I, I'm not really worried about holding them or even buying some new ones, especially if there's any temporary weakness under $4 in copper, which is always still possible here. Because the other unknown card is how hard is the United States going to decline? Remember, most people have been talking about soft landing or no landing. I think they're in for a big surprise. I think we're going to really see by the end of this year, we have a substantial recession going on in the United States. So we'll see what that does. Uh, probably lessens some of the upside for copper, but there's still enough upside to be worthy to hold it as an investment. Okay. I'm glad you explained that because two, three months ago, like you were saying, I was looking at copper and thinking, what is going on here? I thought this wasn't supposed to all be playing out for, for years. And so it was, it was an interesting scenario there. It was a squeeze, Charlotte. There was, a, there was an actual physical copper squeeze going on, uh, and that's what helped accelerate it. And in a sense, hindsight looks at if you're bullish, it actually wasn't in our best interest to happen because it created a much higher false price than needed versus the gradual rise we would have seen, and therefore now, you know, brought more disappointment that needed to be. But uh, it still has tremendous benefits. If you're going to buy the story that the Don't Worry, Be Happy crowd says on Wall Street, about growth worldwide, AI, electric vehicle, infrastructure, all the things that they predict are going to get bigger and better. Copper is a key player in that. Okay, this has all been really informative. I'll put it back to you just one more time. If there's any final thoughts you wanted to leave investors with, perhaps let us know where we can find you if we, if we want to learn more. Well, most of it is on X, Twitter is where I do most of my communicating. I do have a blog petergranish.com and I do put interviews that I'm blessed like you do uh, up on our YouTube channel. I, I just think that experience is usually a good teacher. The complacency is at such a high level given all the things now that look so much far worse than any other time in my career. That live chicken versus a dead duck attitude I just think is proper now. And even if we're wrong and we do have happy days a year again, we didn't hurt ourselves, but if we're right, and most people don't follow that, uh, we're going to be one of the few that are going to be able to get through those tough times while others won't. Okay. Well, I think that's a good place to wrap it up. Thank you so much for coming on to go over gold, uranium, copper markets. It was always really good to have you. And thank you. And it's always a blessing to be speaking with you. We'll definitely have you back soon. For now, once again, I'm Charlotte McLeod with investingnews.com, and this is Peter Grandich.